Hello, my name is Gabrielle de Michele, and I'm going to be presenting some joint work with Pierre Godry and Cécile Pierrot on discrete logarithm algorithms in pairing relevant finite fields. So the discrete logarithm problem is one of the two major mathematical problems on which is based the security of asymmetric cryptography protocols, the other one being factorization. So the discrete logarithm problem can be found for key exchange protocols such as Diffie-Hellman, LGML, or some signature protocols such as ECDSA, DSA, etc. So the definition goes as follows. Given a finite cyclic group G, a generator G of this group, and a target element H of the group G, we want to find the exponent X such that G to the X is equal to the target element H. So one question that arises from this definition is what finite cyclic group G can I choose? So for uh, cryptographic purposes, we want uh, the group G to be chosen in such a way that DLP is as hard as possible. So commonly used, commonly used groups are prime finite fields, finite fields, or elliptic curves over finite fields, for example. DLP is used in protocols that are widely deployed, such as, for example, the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman protocol, as mentioned before, which is present here, for example, in this TLS handshake. Another interesting example, which we're going to focus on, is uh, pairing-based protocols. Let me go back to definitions. So what is a cryptographic pairing? A pairing is a map between the product of two groups, two additive groups, into a target multiplicative group, GT. Uh, the map has a few properties that one uh, needs to satisfy. So first, it has to be bilinear, non-degenerate, and also for practicality reasons, we want E to be efficiently computable. In cryptography, the groups that are often chosen for pairings are uh, G1 and G2 are often subgroups of elliptic curves over prime fields or finite fields, and the target group GT is often a subgroup of a finite field FPN. Pairing has been used a lot in older uh, protocols and in more recent protocols, uh, such as ZK SNARKs, which is an applicable um, use for blockchain, Zcash, etc. So it is an interesting example, not only because it is used in many protocols, but also because it uses the discrete logarithm problems on both elliptic curves and also on finite fields. So one question that we try to answer in this paper that we look at in, uh, in depth is how to construct a secure pairing-based protocol. And the simple, the simple answer, which turns out to be not so simple, is to look at DLP algorithms on both uh, the elliptic curve side and on the finite field side. So let us start with the discrete logarithm problems on elliptic curves. The best known algorithm is polar row, which has a complexity and square root of the size of the subgroup that is being considered. And not much uh, is said on this slide because there has not been many major um, gain in the complexity uh, since a few decades uh, regarding DLP on elliptic curves. However, on discrete, uh, on the finite field side, the discrete logarithm algorithms have a lot, evolved a lot in the past decades. There are many of them, and their complexities often depend on uh, the relation that there exists between the characteristic p and the extension degree n of a finite field, which uh, we define as fpn throughout this talk. So as mentioned before, the complexity of many uh, algorithms uh, for DLP on finite fields depends on this relation between P and N. And one useful way uh, to express this relation is to use this L notation. So this L notation is this um, very ugly formula in the green box, which uh, depends on two parameters, LP and C. And it is defined as the exponential of some constant C. So the second parameter is this C in front of a log pn raised to the power lp and a log log pn raised to the power 1 minus lp. So what is interesting regarding the complexities of these algorithms that are expressed using this lp uh, and notation is that if 1 tends, uh, makes lp tend to 0, then this whole formula goes to some log of pn, which corresponds to a polynomial time algorithm. On the other hand, if lp tends to 1, uh, then we end up with um, Pn, which corresponds to some exponential time algorithm. So this LP that varies between 0 and n defines, uh, allows us throughout this L notation to define uh, what is called a sub-exponential time algorithm, a complexity which is not as bad as exponential, but not as good as polynomial. 
So all the complexities that we are going to see, most complexities that we're going to see, I should um, be careful with the quasi-polynomial time algorithms, are expressed using this L notation where this L is a constant between zero and one. This L notation also allows us to define three families of finite fields where the characteristic P is expressed uh, using, again, this L notation. So depending on this relation between P and N, we have finite fields that are said to be of small characteristic, medium characteristic, and large characteristic. And what is interesting with the algorithms that solve the LP on finite field is that depending on the area, the zones where uh, the finite fields are, these algorithms are going to be different and are not going to perform as well. So the complexities is also, are also going to vary depending on which area we're, we're uh, looking at. So we are interested in a particular area, which is uh, what we call the first boundary case, which is exactly the area between small and medium characteristic. So it is the area where the characteristic P is defined to be exactly of the form LPN of one third. The CP, which is the second constant in the L notation, is often ignored, if not important, um, depending on the context. So why do we look at this area? For two main reasons. The first one is uh, concerning pairings. This is the area where uh, pairings take their values. And since one of our goals is to look at the security of pairing based protocols, then we're interested in, um, of course, the area that concerns pairings. The other reason why we look at this area is because it is um, an area where a lot of algorithms overlap. We have algorithms coming from the small characteristic world, from the medium character characteristic world, which both apply to the boundary case, but it is not entirely clear which one uh, performs best and which one are actually applicable up to where. So this area uh, required some studying. So going back to the first reason, the first, the first motivation for uh, studying this first boundary case, we go back to um, the security of pairings. And uh, in order to have a secure pairing, we want the DLP, so the discrete logarithm problem, to be as hard on the elliptic curve side and on the finite field side. So one can look at uh, the known, complexity of, uh, known complexities of these algorithms uh, for the finite field size, side and the first thing one can do is to ignore the small characteristic area because we know there are some quasi-polynomial algorithms with, with much better complexities. This leaves us with a LPN of one third complexity for all the other um, known algorithms in medium and high characteristic. Then the idea is to balance these complexities. And we know that for uh, the elliptic curve side, we have the square root of P, um, which comes from a polar row. So when, when we balance all these complexities, we end up with a characteristic P of the form LPN of one third. And this corresponds exactly to this boundary case, which uh, we discussed before. So now what do we focus on on this paper? Well, the idea is to study the behavior of all these algorithms that exist in this area in order to then draw some conclusions for the security of pairing based protocols. So let us now discuss about these algorithms that exist to solve DLP in finite fields. So most of them come from a family of algorithms called index calculus algorithms, and they all follow the same uh, steps. We consider a finite field FPN and a factor basis F, which consists of a small element. So F is a small set of small elements. The three main step of any index calculus algorithms are a relation collection step, when we find relations between these elements of our factor basis, a linear algebra step where we solve the linear equations. So if we have enough of these relations that we've collected in step one, we can form a system of equations where the unknowns are the discrete logarithms of the elements of our factor basis. If we have enough equations, as many as we have unknowns, we can solve this system and then we end up with the discrete logarithms of all the elements of our factor basis. This allows us to proceed to the last step, which is the individual logarithm step, or also called a descent step, where uh, the goal is to solve a DLP for a target element H, and we do so by using uh, the discrete elements of the elements of F, uh, the discrete logarithm, sorry, of the elements of F, which were computed in the step above, in the linear algebra step. 
So one of the most well-known algorithms from this index calculus algorithms family is the number field sieve. The number field sieve is often illustrated by this, uh, this commutative diagram that is given on the slide. And it starts by choosing two polynomials, F1 and F2, in such a way that this diagram commutes. So F1 and F2 allows to define two number fields, one on the left, one on the right, and this is where the name of the algorithm comes from. And now the idea of this diagram is to uh, define, to compute some um, relations where relations come from um, algebraic norms that are uh, factored in both uh, number fields. And if they are B-smooth, B-smooth uh, means that for a given constant B that is defined, they factor into elements that are smaller than b. So if they are b smooths on both sides, then this results in a relation. So we have an equality because the diagram commutes between this uh, product of elements smaller than b. This allows, this creates what we call a relation. And as mentioned before, if we have enough of those, then um, we can solve our system and have the discrete logarithms of uh, the elements of the factor basis. So all the technical details are in the paper or in general in the literature. There's been a lot of work on the number field sieve. And in particular, throughout the years, uh, many variants have um, been put uh, forward to improve on the complexity of the number field sieve. One of these variants is called the uh, multiple NFS. So the multiple NFS simply considers a more number fields than just two, as in the classical NFS setup. So we um, have, again, a commutative diagram where instead of considering two number fields, we have V1s, which are defined by polynomials. Again, two are chosen at the very beginning of the algorithm, just as in NFS, and then the other ones are just linear combinations of uh, these two initial polynomials. So this uh, results in uh, some trade-offs in the complexity, but overall the complexity is lowered uh, using MNFS. Another variant is the tower number field sieve, where again, the setup is uh, very similar to NFS. The steps of the algorithms are the same as for any index calculus algorithm, but here we just simply add extra algebraic structure, again, in order to uh, lower the complexity of NFS, of the variant. Another uh, variant of NFS is the special uh, number field sieve, where here the uh, difference comes from the characteristic P, which is defined as the evaluation of a polynomial of some degree lambda with some small coefficients. So in this case, P has this special form, uh, which gives the name to the algorithm. And again, in this particular setup with P of this particular form, then uh, we have an algorithm which with a lower complexity than uh, the classical NFS. So how do we evaluate the complexity of NFS and also all of its variants? So NFS or any index calculus algorithm have these three uh, steps. And so the overall complexity of the algorithm is uh, simply the sum of the three costs of each of these steps. So in order to maximize, to, sorry, to optimize uh, the overall complexity, we want to maximize, um, optimize the maximum of these three costs. So this is rather complicated for uh, several reasons. Uh, first of all, NFS and its variants have a lot of parameters. Some are discrete, some are continuous. Uh, these parameters vary depending on the variance we're considering, depending on the polynomial selection that we're using to select the first uh, two polynomials, F1 and F2. There are some boundary issues. So this whole optimization problem uh, for which we use Lagrange multipliers becomes all the more complex because of the number of parameters that are being considered. When we solve the polynomial system, we use Grubner basis algorithms. And on top of all of this, a lot of analytical, anal analytic number theory results um, must be considered. So in the end, in this work, uh, we have looked at the complexity of all these algorithms, uh, along with all their uh, variants, uh, both for the algorithms and the polynomial selection, and this resulted in these two plots where we have the complexities as a function of CP, which is the second constant in the L notation for all the variants and all the polynomial selections. So an a surprising fact that we've noticed when computing these uh, complexities is that not all the variants are applicable at the boundary case. For example, if we want to use the special um, number field sieve, so SNFS, <coughs> 
with uh, the tower setup, then this results in norms that are much larger um, than expected and thus a much higher complexity. So some variants cannot be combined precisely in this boundary case. Now we can also look at algorithms that comes from the um, small characteristic area. Since we are uh, precisely at the boundary case, we are interested in the ones that come from the medium characteristics, so NFS and all these variants, but we should also look at how applicable and how well these algorithms from the small characteristic area perform at the boundary case. So one of these algorithms is called the function field sieve. And the function field sieve is very similar to NFS, except you should think of function fields instead of number fields and look at it as a special variant. So one result of our work was actually to uh, reduce, to uh, lower the complexity of FFS by working in some shifted finite fields. So this is a very similar argument as is done for the tower setup, where if we consider a finite field FPN, instead of actually working in FPN, we work in a translated field F prime eta, where P prime, for example, is uh, P times kappa, where N is this composite kappa times eta. So we were working in a translated um, finite field, which allows us to lower the complexity. All the technical details are given in the paper. And finally, from the small characteristic world, we should mention the quasi-polynomial algorithms, which um, a lot of work has been done in the past decade. Up to very recently, in 2019, where Kleining and Vizilovsky uh, proved uh, this complexity um, uh, given by the theorem uh, just stated below. So in the end, what do we have? We have this um, little image that shows us which are the best algorithms depending on uh, the area in which you are located. So in the small characteristic on the very left, we have these uh, QP, these quasi-polynomial quasi algorithms. On the right, in the medium characteristic, we have all these variants of NFS. These variants, of course, uh, are not always applicable. It depends on the considerations that are made on N and P, whether P is special or not, whether N is composite or not. And then we focus on this boundary case, where not only do we have all the variants of NFS, but we also have the function field sieve, which is applicable in this area. So one um, part of our work has been to precisely identify the crossover points where FFF stops, uh, FFS stops being uh, the best algorithm and the um, variance of NFS starts outperforming FFS. And similarly, we have an over um, crossover point between FFS and the quasi-polynomial uh, algorithms in our paper. So the motivation for having all this precise analysis about these algorithms is uh, the security of parents. So we would like to answer the following question asymptotically, what finite fields FPN should be considered in order to achieve the highest level of security when constructing a parent. So the goal is to precisely find P and N that answers the question above. So this question can be answered now that we have this entire analysis of all the algorithms at this, at this boundary case, which is the area where um, parents take their values. And so the idea here is to look for the value of CP. So again, CP is the second constant in the L notation that maximizes the minimum between the complexity on the elliptic curve side and the complexity on the finite field side. So from this whole analysis, we've seen that the complexities for the finite field side for DLP are decreasing functions, functions of CP. On the other hand, for elliptic curves, we have polar rho, which is an increasing function. The complexity depends on this value rho, which um, characterizes the size of the subgroup considered. So here in this plot, we take rho equals one to two, and again, details about rho are given in the paper. And so the optimal CP that has to be chosen in order to balance the two complexities are given, is given by the intersection point between the complexity of polar rho and the complexity of the best algorithm for uh, DLP. So as one can see, FFS is um, the plot in uh, yellow, orange yellow, which is far on the left. So it is not um, considered in, uh, this analysis for pairings as its complexity becomes much higher uh, for values of CP that are considered. So this plot gives um, 
the intersection points for all the variants of um, NFS. So not only MNFS, but also MXTNFS when we have a composite um, N, when we have uh, the tower setup, and uh, also curves for the special number field sieve. So one can then identify precisely, depending on the considerations you want to make on uh, the characteristic P and the extension degree N, uh, throughout this plot can precisely identify the crossover points. This is summarized in the following table. So for example, if we take N uh, prime, non-composite, and a normal P, so no special form, then one can uh, see that the best algorithm to solve DLP for finite field is the multiple number field sieve, A, um, is the polynomial selection that is being used, and so the crossover point is for CP equals 4.45. This allows one to define a precise P and then, um, um, and then the uh, corresponding N in order to define uh, the finite field that has to be used to construct a secure pairing. So there were some surprising facts that we've noticed um, when considering the security for pairings, one of which is the fact that using a special form for P does not always make the pairing less secure as one could think because SNFS would tend to lower the complexity. Indeed, if we look at um, the first line of the table, we see that uh, if we take a special prime and a lambda, which is the degree of the polynomial used for uh, defining P, and this lambda is equal to 20, then the curve of SNF, SNFS sorry, is uh, above the curve of MNFS. So, SNFS does not perform better for this particular uh, value of lambda. So one can choose um, values of lambda for which MNFS will outperform SNF. So this was one surprising fact that we've noticed um, when studying the security of pairings. So this concludes my talk. Thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer questions during the session.